the clock tower, home to the many starred clock. Lily finally ponders the four items, the puff of fog, the flask of water, the rare earth clay, and the kindling wood. The flask of water is stated that it could not exist without a solid foundation to settle in upon. That foundation must be rare earth clay, earth. The puff of fog stated that it filled with water that became too heavy and came crashing down to rejoin with those who came before. So water came before air. The writing carved into the kindling wood stated that it needed the air to live, and that such is the way of those who have come later in life. Fire is last. And so the order must be earth, water, air, and fire. Hello again. Are you back to continue on with our next round of challenges, or did you have something else in mind? Yeah, I think Lily would like to be evaluated for guild membership in the Cloak Tower. You were sent for four reagents, and you have them. Well done. Now you shall face a test of mind and body. You'll be teleported to a room where you must destroy one of my aut automatons. Tools will be found there that will simplify the task. They take animal campaigns or henchmen, but you're being tested, not they. If they cause you to fail, it's still your failure. Keep them under complete control. <laughs> Use the knowledge from my first task, and this test will be simple. But if you leave before the automaton is destroyed, you have failed. Alright, ask him if Lily's ready. Thinks you'd rather prepare. Return when you are. Lily reviews her knowledge of the inner planes. Picture a sphere. At one pole is the plane of positive energy. At the opposite pole, the plane of negative energy. And around the equator, equidistant, are the elemental planes of earth, fire, air, and water. Only adjoining planes intersect to create the parallel elemental planes of magma, smoke, ice, and ooze. It's actually easier to view the spheres cut in half in order to view both halves simultaneously. The elements intersect with the energy planes to create the quasi-elemental planes. Radiance, lightning, steam, and mineral for positive, and ash, dust, salt, and vacuum for negative. Hello again. Are you back to continue on with our next round of challenges, or did you have something else in mind? All right, I think Lily's ready. You have not yet destroyed the golem in my second challenge. All right, telling Lily that she'll be teleported there. Step into the portal and the test will begin. Elementals, power elementals, quasi elementals. The leeches hopes that there aren't any more elemental methods. Altura said to keep Bones under complete control. Oh boy, alright. Tell him Bones to. <laughs> look at this guy though. Minigon, look at all these immunities. Holy cow. Alright. And that tools here would simplify the task. An alchemist's apparatus, and on it a wand infused with energy from the elemental plane of air, and charged with a color spray spell. Interesting. But useless against the Minigon, as it's immune to mind-affecting spells like color spray. Perhaps this is a test of faith in the guild, that the tools will be effective regardless of what one may think. Stones, and among them a wand infused with energy from the elemental plane of Earth, charged with the stone skin spell. A tool, 
Maybe not to be used as one may think. A divining pool, and near it a wand infused with energy from the elemental plane of water. Charged with a slow spell. A wood pile, and atop a wand infused with energy from the elemental plane of fire. Charged with the burning hand spell. Four tools from four elemental planes. Tools, not weapons, not even defenses. Altura had said to mark well the order. The order is earth, water, air, and fire. Or with the wands, stone skin, slow, color spray, and burning hands. Lily readies the wands and nervously approaches the Minagon. Now, of course, this doesn't seem very intuitive, but I think the main clue is, uh... Which one is it? Here it is. Elemental Wand of Air. Color Spray. It's a mind-affecting spell, which a Minigon is immune to. This is not meant to be used in a combative way. Similarly, the Stone Skin is not meant to be used defensively. <laughs> Earth came first. Earth was followed by water. Next came air. Alright, fire is the end. Fire is my end. The automaton destroyed Lily's test is complete. Bonesy gets a curt pat from his mistress for being both obedient and patient. He would have likely gotten cleaved in two by the Iron Minotaur and his mistress soon after otherwise. Lily can't hide a prideful smile. This will certainly be more prestigious than an instructorship. Hello again. Are you back to continue on with our next round of challenges, or did you have something else in mind? All right, Lily reporting that she's destroyed her automaton. Congratulations, you've shown great ingenuity. By destroying my automaton, you've earned a place in the many-starred cloak. I present you with the symbol of your guild. Wear this cloak with pride and know that the guild stands ready to serve in the future. Lily Black, Cloak Wizard. Not only should this improve her standing with fellow Cloak Wizard Ophala, but with Lord Nasher as well. The many stored cloak itself is masterfully crafted, stitched on both sides with glittering stars. Not only is it a symbol of the guild, but useful as well. It resists fire and electricity, and improves concentration. Lily tries it on and notices to her surprise that the glittering stars themselves emit a soft blue light. Finally, access to guild member stock. With her back to El Tora, Lily touches an eagle feather to her nose for a better bargain. Got up. Ooh, okay. Welcome, member. What do you require? Yeah, I think I'd like to see the special equipment available only to guild members. <laughs> guild member stock is impressive indeed. An actual moonstone mask. Even though it's not the original mask rumored to be of Nether's origin, owned by Ophala herself, it still commands over 12,000 coin. Lily's heard that they allow the ladies to see in darkness, 
if not with Infravision, but Altura explains that they're better than that. Not only do they allow the ladies to see with dark vision, but with improved perception among other things. The guild also offers cheap imitations of the mask for mere coppers on the platinum. Lily buys two of them, with a polite smile on her face, as if they were Neverwintian mementos. In fact, they will be perfect for her and Little Red as black thievy masks. You know, in case the android burglary for Ophala turns into a robbery. Of course, he'll suspect Ophala's involvement, thinking he's being robbed by ladies in a mask, but he'd likely guess that anyway, as Rumbottom did. But they are especially cheap and shoddily made. It will be almost embarrassing to wear them. No matter. Surprisingly, the only spell available from guild member stock that wasn't available from the regular stores is Endurance. She also has spellbook covers. She doesn't offer Wolf's Hide, but she has an interesting one in Crag Cat, which Lily takes. Lily asks about an elegant looking silver band. Altura explains it's a ring of the Wood Elves, crafted by the Elves of the Neverwinter Wood given to Lady Arabeth when she was only a child at her home of Thundertree by the ranger Ansel Bloodshoulder. Supposedly, Lady Arabeth saved Thundertree from a power-hungry Luskin wizard using the ring. The guild offers a bag of holding. Lily barely needs to ponder whether to buy it. Altura claims that this one may have come from as far across the multiverse as Kryn. Welcome, member. What do you require? Kryn. Lily did not want to be reminded of Reyna or the other Salamic Knights of the Rose in her planar sphere from there. She puts it out of her mind while buying what spells she can afford. The bag of holding itself appears to be a common cloth sack, about two feet by four feet in size. It opens into non-dimensional space. Its inside is larger than its outside dimensions. Regardless of what is put into the bag, it will always weigh a fixed amount, one pound. Different bags have different inner weight limits, though they start at 250 pounds and bear as much as 1,500 pounds for the exceptional ones. One must be careful with non-dimensional spaces, however. Rupturing the bag will ruin it, and any contents inside will be lost forever. Surprisingly enough, the bag can be turned inside out spilling its contents and becoming a normal sack. In an emergency, Lily could even hide in the bag for 10 minutes without suffocating. And as has been mentioned previously, placing a bag of holding in a portable hole creates a rift in the astral plane causing both to be lost. And placing a portable hole in a bag of holding creates a similar rift except this time causing both to be destroyed, as well as all creatures within 10 feet of the rift. Otherwise, Lily's surprised to hear that Lady Arabeth comes from Thundertree. What humble beginnings. Thundertree is a small, quiet logging hamlet of only about 90 folk on the south bank of the Neverwinter River, at the western edge of Neverwinter Wood. At most, two days ride east of Neverwinter itself. The hamlet is led by Ansel Bloodshoulder, who gave Lady Arabeth the ring. He works with the town's woodcutters to carefully choose which trees are to be cut and to ensure that new trees are planted whenever they are. Rumor is he's a harper. Anyway, most of that timber comes west to the shipyards, house builders, and carpenters of Neverwinter. Lily sits to learn her newly acquired spells and to rememorize Nock in anticipation of the Android burglary. 
Bones sniffs and gives a disapproving snort at the crag cat cover, for which he gets a swift smack on the nose from his mistress. She's not to be disturbed. In the meantime, I can explain a bit about infravision or dark vision, as we saw granted by a real Moonstone mask, not the <laughs> cheap imitations that Lily bought. Infravision from 2nd edition, the ability to see 60 feet into total darkness, was granted to dwarves, elves, gnomes, half-elves, and even some halflings. Whether it actually revealed the infrared spectrum was an optional rule. For 3rd edition, it's been replaced by dark vision, now only granted to dwarves and half-orcs, and explicitly stated as a black and white vision only. Elves, gnomes, and half-elves are now instead granted low-light vision, a color vision, allowing them to see twice as far as normal in dim light. Halflings were left out. After a number of hours, Lily is finished with her trance. Even though she's a cloak wizard now, given free passage throughout the cloak tower, there seems to be no chance of finding Halivor's universal pantograph. So much for counterfeiting coin. Too bad she even had the bag of holding. It's late morning in Neverwinter, and Lily is now a member of the prestigious Many Starred Cloak Mages Guild, in such esteemed company as fellow cloak wizard Ophala Chelderstorn. Speaking of which, Lily is ready to reunite the Black Lake burglars for one last larceny for the matron of the Moonstone Mask. And this time, she has black thieving masks for the entire company. Well, Maybe not the quadrupeds, but panthers and wolves all look alike anyway.